Hi, my name is Kevin Lancey. I'm a faculty here at the University of Arizona in the Department of Civil, Eng Civil and Architectural Engineering and Mechanics. Um, I am the host today for our first uh, Science to Policy and Diplomacy seminar on uh, science, science diplomacy and, and global affairs. Um, we have three uh, preeminent speakers today from the, from the field, um, and uh, we'll lead off this, this afternoon with John Bowright, followed by Michael Clegg, and uh, finishing up with Ronette Prower today. Um, this is, a, as I mentioned, uh, our, first our first of our seminar series. The University of Arizona has hosted several conferences uh, in 2017 and 19 on science policy and diplomacy. And uh, now given the times, we're shifting to, to uh, continuing that idea of, of outreach to the community by uh, doing these seminar series online. Um, <clears throat> uh, the first one, as I mentioned, is, is on science, diplomacy, and global affairs. We'll have one, and please keep an eye on it, uh, on food, energy, water, or excuse me, food security. Uh, Sherry Murray here at the university is, is uh, working with several folks, including the people at the, the, the World Academy of Sciences to bring people in for that. So this will be a, a, a global uh, view of food security um, and we're occurring in, in uh, late June or early July. And we'll, we'll get postings out to everyone on that as well. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Hassan Bafai for, for bringing this together and getting us organized. And uh, with that, I will uh, shift directly to uh, introductions of our speakers. And uh, uh, as I do that, I just want to note if there's questions uh, from the audience as we start, please uh, put them in the Q&A or in the chat, and we could then work with those and, and add them to our list as we, we, uh, as we get to the end of the talks. So uh, the structure today will be our three talks, which will last around uh, 45 to, to 60 minutes, and then we'll have about a half hour, 45 minutes, half an hour to 45 minutes for questions of our, of our speakers. So, um, as I mentioned then, uh, John Bowright will lead off, um, Michael Clegg will follow, and Ron at Prow will be third. Uh, John will speak about um, his lessons learned in his roles as a, a, a government official, on nuclear proliferation and energy use uh, as a US um, as a US in the US Embassy and State Department science counselor and with in his present role as the National Academies build the capacity and partnerships to meet global challenges. Um, <clears throat> Michael Clegg will follow talking about the uh, an application or a site which has been a, a renowned site for science policy or science diplomacy and, and in Iasis, Iasa, um, and its history over time and its contributions. Uh, uh, Ronit Prower then will we'll finish our talk today talking about uh, how uh, we can measure the, the uh, impact and benefits and, and value of science policy and diplomacy, particularly for, for the home countries. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, John Bowright will begin today. John is the currently executive director of the Office of International Affairs at the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, in, from 94 to 95, he is deputy associate director for national security and international affairs at the Office of Science and Technology and, and Policy in the executive office of the president. After spending five years as deputy assistant uh, secretary for science and technology affairs at the Department of State. Um, prior to that, he was he ran he was director for international uh, programs at the National Science Foundation, and developing programs in Japan, Asia, and Eastern Europe. And he worked uh, earlier than that as the in the Department of State in Goddard uh, Space Facility, uh, among other locations. Um, he has his PhD from uh, in physics from Cornell University, and is a member of Phi Beta Kappa. So with that. Uh, I will pass it to John, and um, again, please send your questions along if you have them, and John, you're ready to go. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I, of course, don't know the audience very well, so uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully this, what I have to go through uh, will be uh, interesting to some and 
for those who know more about it, it may be, it may be provocative and that's good for discussion. Um, I think that it is really important to be clear uh, by what we mean by science and diplomacy. Uh, and in particular, as uh, probably those of you who've had any classes on it know, uh, that is sometimes broken down into sort of three components. And I think this is really valuable because otherwise we don't, we're not really clear, I think, on, on what, what we're doing, who's doing it, why, and so on. So uh, as, as probably most of, your, of the audience knows or the participants, uh, it can be looked at as diplomacy for science. Uh, we can all come back to that in a minute. It also can be looked at as the, the science that's involved in preparing diplomacy and pursuing diplomacy. That is within, within a, a given government, ours in this case, uh, the science as part of the policymaking process. And then the third, which is sometimes called science for diplomacy, or perhaps to be a little even more clear, is science as a tool for dipl diplomacy, uh, which I think is often, often the, the usual meaning that, that people have in mind when, when they talk about science diplomacy. Uh, so let me just say a, a little bit about each of those three and maybe uh, give a couple of examples of, of uh, what has arisen in that context in, in my zigzag through the bureaucracy and the science community. Uh, in diplomacy for science, uh, that is, you know, that what that means to me is what does science, because it's an inherently international undertaking, uh, what, how, do, how do we make it the international cooperation effective? And that has to do with things uh, like uh, the uh, visas, it has to do with access to research sites in other countries, it has to do with global data sharing, it, uh, it has to do with uh, samples uh, crossing borders or not. And, um, and all of those things need, need some help from governments to make it happen. For example, visas, of course, are a government function uh, and so on. I ran into a lot of, a lot of these issues uh, at NSF. Uh, but also as a, as a science counselor in, in Paris. And so just a, a couple of examples. When I was in Paris, and this is a while ago, this is in the, in the 80s, um, that, uh, HIV, and AIDS, HIV and AIDS were just then being understood and, and related to each other. And there was there was just at a time when a lot of cooperation was needed, there was some real friction over who got credit for what. Uh, in particular, a, again, I'll be slightly indiscreet and, and use, use names, but uh, 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 the, the leader on the US side was Robert Gallo. On the French side, uh, it was Luc Montagnier. And both of them and their teams had, had done very important work in, in piecing that puzzle together, but things were not going well in terms of cooperation and feeling between the, between the, uh, the two. And it was urgent. It's, uh, it, it really needed to be figured out fast and what and, and some way to approach this AIDS epidemic uh, needed to be found. Uh, I remember I got a call from Jonas Salk. I did, had no idea. He was, uh, he was alive and I certainly knew he didn't know who I was, but he was calling to try to, to get me to organize a three-way discussion between him and the two teams to sort of sort out a, 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 a modus vivendi and a way, a basis for uh, active cooperation. That's an, that's an example of, 
of at least uh, an encounter I had with, with a diplomacy for science. Uh, the, the other, the, though the main ones that I listed uh, are, are very pervasive and, and they are not simple. Um, the, for example, to do field work in other countries is, is absolutely critical. And for any of the field uh, uh, dis disciplines, biodiversity, uh, the earth sciences and so on. Uh, and that is a whole culture of how to do that appropriately. And the key being that in general, access to information and cooperation is, is built by, by peer-to-peer -peer cooperation rather than one country simply opening the door and letting the researchers from the other country in. And that uh, is a way to build trust in how, in, what, in, in basically, uh, as to what's actually going on and whether things of value are being exported and, and so on. And so that has become a, a cornerstone of international cooperation, of, of international access to other countries that, it, that, co that cooperation is, is basically a cornerstone. It essentially is a, men, um, a way to build trust and understanding and trust I guess I've been thinking a lot more about trust in the last few years, but that's a really, really important part of our whole uh, of society issues in general, but in this case, in this case, science. And we know, and from recent experience and what is what the state of international affair, affairs are now, that trust is an extremely important uh, con uh, context for success, also in the national context, but in, uh, but in the international context, which we're talking about now. Um, secondly, the second uh, category that I listed was science in diplomacy. And what, what I mean by that is as a country, in this case us, uh, the United States, uh, makes its, por its foreign policy and pursues that foreign policy, it needs a lot of science. And uh, I, uh, I saw that certainly in working on arms control where uh, we, this was early days right after the non-proliferation treaty, uh, but there was a proliferation of spreading of nuclear technology called um, Atoms for Peace without an awful lot of thought as to what might be some of the security implications for that. And uh, so I was part of, of, a, of quite a group of scientists who were hired in the US government. However, they, and this I think has, is, is another um, mainstream of, of the, of how things, are best, uh, are best pursued, almost always the government, the scientists in government uh, were working very closely with a large number of top level scientists outside of government. And that, that as I think probably everybody knows, uh, is just absolutely essential in, in big questions like climate change and sea level rise and so on, uh, oceans issues uh, and global health, which of course the crisis we've all been living through for the last uh, well over a year is, is, is a quintessential global challenge. And all of our governments have needed, needed to supplement their expertise within the government uh, by, by calling in the best of the science community to help in various ways, and in, uh, in this case, as you know, heroically to produce vaccines in times that had were essentially unthinkable until it just had to be done. Uh, 
so this idea of science in diplomacy, that is in preparing to pursue national interests, is 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 kind of a all hands on deck, and it and it, it just by its essential nature calls on scientists uh, throughout uh, throughout the country. Uh, one example of that that's been sustained for many years uh, that uh, I learned about in, in both as a government official when I was in the arms control agency in the State Department and then outside now at the National Academies is the National Academies Committee on uh, uh, CSAC, the Committee on International Science, uh, uh, sorry, International Security and Arms Control. And that is, is, a, is a committee that for many years, starting back in the depths of the Cold War, uh, was de uh, developed uh, dialogues with counterparts starting in the Soviet Union, uh, continuing in Russia when the Soviet Union became Russia, but also uh, quite soon after the Russian uh, series, a similar kind of interaction with top level scientists from China uh, and uh, to some degree from India. And that, that's a very interesting thing. In order to be, for this to happen, uh, it, top level scientists who were not in the government were essentially the only way to do it. And, and it was made very carefully clear to everybody involved how it worked, at least on our side. Of course, the Soviet Union and, and, uh, and China are, are different societies, different governments, and, and uh, they had to work out their own arrangements. Uh, but in the case of the United States, for example, the, um, the Committee on International Security and Arms Control was, was appointed by the Academy of Sci our National Academy of Sciences and uh, of, uh, consisted of non-governmental scientists, but th this is very important, a, a substantial number of, of uh, rather recently retired high-level uh, military people and, and uh, people from the security fields in government. So it, it was a non-government, is a non-governmental, discussion, but very well informed by top level expertise. It's been extraordinarily valuable in reaching common understanding as to, uh, to put it quite simply, uh, what can go wrong uh, with a world full of, of many thousands of nuclear weapons and, uh, and imperfect communication and, uh, and hostile relationships. So uh, again, that, that's an interesting example uh, in science, in diplomacy, of how, in fact, it's a government, a, a, the government's efforts are supplemented by non-government efforts. The arrangement has always been that the uh, government is informed, State Department in our case, or, or the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, informed of these, of these interactions and is given summary of those interactions. And our partners on the other side, Russian or Chinese, uh, are, are uh, well informed that that is what's, that is what's happening. But it, it has allowed uh, active, uh, positive and effective discussion and exploration of things that just is very difficult um, in, um, in, in uh, in the, uh, let me just check. Okay, um, so the third, the third category, uh, science as a tool for diplomacy, is what a lot of people mean, and it's in this case, I think it's something we need to be careful about. Um, the, the international cooperation in science is a natural thing. It's an extraordinarily powerful uh, uh, tool just by its nature for international understanding. Uh, it is literally a global language and it is critical in solving global, uh, common global problems. So it's, it's really very powerful. 
Um, and, and in the course of international cooperation, the, the personal relationships that are built are very, very important. Uh, but one of the, one of the uh, definitions and probably the, the man on the street definition of diplomacy is pursuit of national interest uh, by, that's what diplomacy is. And so when we have difficult relationships, which is, that's when proactive efforts are needed to actually build cooperation. We, we this often is with countries where in fact, the US policy either overtly or, or quietly is what one would call regime change. And of course, that is not a, a good way to start, co to start cooperation. So I think in, in many cases, science cooperation is probably better simply presented as what it really is, which is science cooperation. And, and not not build per se as as a uh, as a dip, as a dip, diplomacy. Uh, if you look in the newspapers these days, the um, uh, there's a lot of talk about about vaccine diplomacy, by which is meant uh, various countries that have produced vaccine are one way or another seeking to to uh, use that access to vaccine uh, in their interest in terms of relations to other countries, whether it's economic or, or uh, economic dependency or agreement on, uh, on divisive international issues. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing for a couple of other reasons. One is sometimes uh, science for diplomacy or as a part of diplomacy has gotten into some very big budget, big budget items. Uh, one of them uh, which failed was the superconducting super collider. And I was, um, as they say, for my sins in the middle of the failed diplomatic efforts uh, to get global uh, funding for a huge uh, high energy particle physics accelerator. That left lots of, lots of, uh, of injured feelings and, and uh, frustration. Uh, another uh, major effort that uh, I just happened to be involved in, uh, in the government to government co um, negotiation was the, the International Space Station and specifically the agreement which brought Russia into the space station uh, deal. And th there, there are two reasons why at least I thought this is really tricky ground. One is it's a, it was an enormous amount of money. And perhaps, you, perhaps it's better not to even call it a, a science project. Uh, it, it, I'm not, it's, not, it's not quite clear what's the right term, but it was billed as a, as a way to do very exciting science. And a lot of the science community that I was listening to uh, felt well. It may be a way to do some science, but it's a terribly expensive way to do some modest uh, to make some modest gains in some modestly interesting scientific questions. Um, so, for one thing, there's the question of of the stakes involved, and are we putting our funds in the most productive way? The other thing is that we can fail. Uh, the science, the, the space station um, could have had, has had problems. It could have had other and more severe problems. The relationship could have been very difficult. And, and it's, it has um, it has come close uh, to, uh, to potentially very, very, very uh, unfortunate um, because it's by, by its nature, it's a very uh, cutting edge, uh, very daring, and it's a, a new, something entirely new and doing things entirely new uh, doesn't always work. So I thought the stakes were very high. I personally thought the science returns were very modest. 
Uh, I thought personally that we should have been putting a lot of money into some other things uh, or more money like energy, uh, like energy, efficient energy technology and climate change. And of course, I wasn't smart enough to know how high uh, uh, pandemic preparation probably should have been on, on, the, uh, on, on the priority list. But um, I, f I found that uh, that whole space station cooperation um, uh, effort is, is, is quite hair raising. Uh, I would, my bottom line for all of these things, the, of these three categories of how science relates to, to uh, diplomacy or in what way, the bottom line almost always for me is science is science. And, and by that, I mean, it, it has to be straight. It cannot be peri cherry picking. It can't be uh, choosing the evidence that goes in a way that, that um, will, that a, a particular government uh, wants to go for, for a variety of, of other reasons. And it, it can't because it will, it will be extremely damaging if, if we try to use use science as a tool in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that does not accurately and honestly uh, pre present the, the, entire, uh, the entire set of knowledge that is available and that we know about that related to a particular issue. And that, that a, a shorter version of that of that uh, wisdom is actually comes from Einstein and it's on the outside of the building at NAS uh, at the National Academy of Sciences. And I think it's, it's really, really important. Uh, we, have, we have sustained respect for science in the United States through some pretty rough times, including the last few years and very difficult uh, divisive politics and so on. And it, I believe it is extremely important that we be clear on what we're doing with international science and why, and that we, that we uh, really respect the, uh, the scientific method and all of its, uh, of its uh, conveying of what is known and with what er error bars and so on. Uh, that covers what I uh, was uh, wanted to convey. Uh, I don't know, uh, and I think I'm probably more or less on time. Kevin? Great, thank you, John. <clears throat> and um, we appreciate the comments. <clears throat> we'll get back to questions. Again, we're gonna hold all the questions until the end. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so we will uh, get back to questions for John excuse me, uh, at the end of the talk after everyone finishes up. Um, our second speaker is Michael Clegg. Uh, Michael is a professor emeritus uh, of biological sciences in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at UC Irvine. He's currently uh, external vice president for the International Council um, uh, for Science, the ICSU, and co-chair of the uh, Inter-America Network of Academy of uh, Academies of Science, uh, uh, Academies of Sciences, IANUS. Um, Michael was elected for membership in the National Academies in 1990, and uh, uh, was also elected as a fellow in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1992. Um, he was he served as the Foreign Secretary for the National Academy of Sciences uh, starting in 2002 and was reelected twice for that position in 2006 and 2010. So he spent a lot of time on the road uh, in, in that role. Um, he's also, he served as president of the American Genetic Association, the International Society for Molecular Biology and Evolution, and is chair of the section on agriculture, food, and natural resources of the uh, American Association for Advancement of Sciences. So uh, quite a lot of responsibility in our field. Um, he's going to be discussing the International Institute for uh, Applied Systems Analysis. Um, <clears throat> I was fortunate enough to visit that site and 
It was the best lunchroom I've ever ate, eaten in. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're, he may show some photos of the site. It's a uh, uh, Schloss uh, uh, Luxembourg, which is a former imperial palace in Austria. And and it was. Uh, I sat down at lunch and looked up, and there was a mural on the ceiling. It was, it was really phenomenal. So, um, But uh, they've had significant contributions in the science diplomacy area, and Mike will provide some, some background and history on that. So I pass to you, Mike. Okay, thank you, Kevin. I'm, the um, International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis is going to be celebrating its 50th anniversary next year. So it's been operating in the science um, diplomacy kind of landscape for quite a long time. And I think it's instructive to begin by talking a little bit about its history of establishment and then to move on to uh, some of the things it does at the current time. So in 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the world probably came as close as it ever has to a full-scale nuclear exchange. And that, that event was personal for me because I was a young paratrooper waiting to be dropped into Cuba at the time, and I didn't really expect to to survive that. And in an alternate universe, many of us might not be here today, but fortunately, uh, wiser heads prevailed and they stepped back from the abyss. And then the, the principles in, in particularly the United States and in the Soviet Union began to try and think about ways to cooperate more. And one of the, after several years of discussions, one of the things that was done was to organize a major summit at Glassboro, New Jersey, which was called the Glassboro Summit. The uh, principal participants were Lyndon Johnson, who was president of the United States, and Alexei Kosygin, who was at that time uh, premier of the Soviet Union. So, at the Glassboro summit, uh, Johnson actually, it, it, and by the way, the backdrop at that time at, in 1967 during the summit was, was, a, was a pretty, pretty uh, demanding one because we were beginning to become more and more involved in the Vietnam War and the six day war between uh, Israel and the Arab states had just occurred. And so it was a very, contentious world and, and a world in crisis. And so this, the genesis of this idea for an international institute really came out of a series of international crises. And um, so Johnson had suggested an East-West think tank as one positive thing that might be done to connect uh, the scientists of Russia and scientists of the United States. And Alexei Kosygin accepted the idea, and this was in 67. Well, by, by 68, the Vietnam War had become much more serious. Uh, Johnson announced that he wouldn't seek re-election, and there was a question of whether this idea would ever really reach any kind of fruition. But it developed that there were a number of people who were very committed to the idea, both in Russia and in and in the United States. So, well, in the United States, one of them was George Bundy, who had been National Security Advisor under Kennedy and Johnson, and then later became president of the Ford Foundation. And he lent some of the you know, prestige and influence of the foundation to the establishment of the Institute. So this East-West Institute for Scientific Cooperation actually finally got stood up in 1972. And there were a series of problems that had to be dealt with in organizing such a venture. Um, among them were how to finance it and who should belong to it. And so they decided that the membership would be uh, governed by what they called national member organizations. There were 12 initial members that were divided more or less equally between the East and the West. Um, in, the United, in, the, in the West, the United States, uh, Britain, France, Ger West Germany were all founding members. Italy was a founding member. Um, then the Eastern states, East Germany, Poland, uh, Soviet Union, 
Czechoslovakia were among the founding members. Um, but one of the initial obstacles was the US did not recognize East Germany and that meant that it couldn't be set up as an organization under an international organization under the UN framework. And so to solve that problem, a different uh, formulation was used uh, to create it as a international scientific institute, but established under a host government and the host government turned out to be Austria. So Austria became the host. And as Kevin mentioned, the uh, Institute is located at a, a former Habsburg hunting lodge, which is about 15 miles or so south of, of um, Vienna, a beautiful setting. And it has been there for its whole history. Uh, this means that, that Austria provides a substantial support for the Institute and has been a, a wonderful host government. Then another problem that had to be solved was what disciplines to focus on in cooperation. And the decision was made to, to focus on applied systems analysis, which is sort of an outgrowth of operations research, which itself was an outgrowth of World War II. And the definition that um, EASA founders used for applied systems analysis was the orderly an orderly analytic study designed to help uh, decision makers identify a preferred course of action among possible alternatives. So it began with this applied systems analysis framework, which was focused on input to decision makers. Um, another question that had to be solved was what language would be the language, the official language that he also would operate on. And the final decision was to use English as the operating language. Then uh, an organization for the Institute had to be agreed on. And it was agreed that um, the Institute would be uh, managed by a director. The first director was Howard Rifa, who was a statistician and decision theorist from Harvard uh, and who had played a key role in the initial decisions to establish EASA and that it would be governed by a council which was composed of the governments that were uh, providing the contributions um, that supported EASA. And the council initially was shared by uh, German Givisciani, who was uh, at that time uh, head of the Central Organ for Research and Technology Policy in the Soviet Union, and also happened to be the son-in-law of Alexei Kosygin. So there was a a fortunate circumstance where there was a, a direct commitment at the highest levels of government to the success of this institute. The, uh, the institute got off the ground very well and focused on building international interdisciplinary teams that used advanced systems analysis to study a whole host of global challenges, both longstanding and emerging. Uh, one of the emerging global challenges that it began to study very early on was the issue of climate change. And it made important contributions to how we approach climate change over the years. Um, it also focused on issues of water resources and water pollution. So very early also, uh, chemists, biologists, and economists carried out work that is still the basis for the modern water policy design in Japan, in the United States, and in the former USSR. The, um, so he also got underway with an initial budget of approximately $10 million and it operated at that level uh, through much of the 70s and, and 80s. During the early 80s, uh, mid 80s, uh, the Reagan administration in the United States decided to withdraw from the YASA because they, somebody in the Reagan administration discovered that there was a, and then that there was a, a US supported organization cooperating with the Soviet Union. Um, but Despite the US government withdrawal, there was a serious effort mounted by some 
the U.S. science community and philanthropic foundations to continue to maintain the U.S. membership in EASA. And then uh, during the George H.W. Bush administration, the first Bush administration, EASA was uh, brought, the U.S. was brought back into the U.S. government, into uh, EASA membership. And that withdrawal and return of the U.S. government has been kind of a common story. It's a challenge to keep a number of member countries participating in an organization like this. So there is a flux in membership over time. Today, there are approximately 22 member countries in EASA, which span the globe. So uh, we have members in Africa, Egypt and South Africa in particular, uh, in Asia, Japan, South Korea, China, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, India are all members of EASA. We have uh, in uh, the Middle East, uh, Israel and um, Jordan is a provisional member and I Iran is a member. Uh, Europe, many of the European states are members, uh, including uh, the Nordic states, Norway, Sweden, and Finland, Germany, um, Austria, of course, and the Great Britain. And then finally, in our hemisphere, the United States and Brazil are full members, and Mexico is an observer. So that's the current status of, of EASA in terms of its membership. Uh, the current budget is about 25 million euros a year. It's composed about equally of um, contributions made by the member states. So about 11 million euros a year comes from the, is in core funding from the member states and uh, the remainder is money for research grants and so forth that he also administers, which are focused on programs of importance and interest to me also. The, um, in the in 1990, the Soviet Union disappeared and there was a question about the, whether he also should continue. And the question was answered by broadening the Institute and making it a player on a global scale uh, rather than just the East-West axis that it had operated on before. The um, um, so he also has a number of, of projects in recent years which work towards the objectives of science diplomacy. One he also led project has been focused on looking at economic ties between the European Union and the Eurasian Economic Union, which is actually composed of, of former Soviet states, including uh, Russia, some of the Baltic states, and um, some of the some of the um, Central Asian states, there's been a fair amount of tension between the EU and the EAEU, which is the Eurasian Economic Union, and in order to help minimize this tension. He also has contributed important work on looking at the challenges and opportunities for economic integration within this wider sphere. Um, there's <clears throat> he also has served to provide a unique and depoliticized platform that allows experts and representatives to meet and discuss opportunities in this context and um, to work on barriers associated with closer economic relations. So um, EOSA's played a, a significant role currently in areas that are important in economic integration. Now I'm gonna, unfortunately, since I can't seem to access the um, the slides that I had, I'm, I'm going to just cite from some of the other things on the slides. The also research has contributed importantly to international science change agreements. So, for example, uh, significant work done at EASA and in collaboration with other organizations 
help provide an understanding of how the world might achieve a 1.5 degree centigrade target for uh, temperature increase in owing to global warming. There are 12 EOS authors have contributed to the various IPC special reports on global warming that underlie the 1.5 degree target. And this all has played a, a key role in helping to facilitate the Paris climate change agreements. Um, and another area of important uh, contemporary work of EASA is in the, is to, is research on novel disaster and climate risk insurance inducements. Um, this work has actually led to um, uh, international mechanism called the Warsaw Mechanism for dealing with these kinds of insurance risks. Yasa has worked as a, as a bridge builder and convener um, in providing uh, the opportunities for economic integration in Europe. Uh, in times of deepest crisis, yeah, between the EU and Europe, it's worked for a depoliticized regime. Let me just see if I can, yes. Finally, in, in another area that he also has worked in that I'd like to cite is uh, global energy problems. Uh, a few years ago, he also launched uh, a major global energy assessment, which has played a big role in helping guide uh, UN targets uh, that were set under the Secretary General Sustainable Energy for All program, and also become a basis for um, the Sustainable Development Goal number seven. This effort was actually led by uh, Naki Nakasinovic, who you all know in Arizona because he participated in some of these previous uh, events that you've hosted on science diplomacy. Yasas uh, also work in a number of areas where there are transboundary issues. One major transboundary issue is in the area of air pollution. Uh, so Yasas work to provide evidence on policy options to decision makers and international negotiators in Europe on in environmental treaties that sustain multiple air that reduce multiple air pollutants, particularly um, sulfur dioxide. So there's a conventional long range transboundary air pollution in the United for, of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe that involves 51 countries where EASA's work has made a, a significant contribution. There's the EU National Emission Ceiling Directive of which in, includes 28 countries where again EOSA's work has been informative and um, finally a uh, EU thematic clean energy strategy, again involving 28 countries. These have recommended pollution reduction measures based on EOSA computer models, particularly one known as the GAINS model and have helped to minimize negative health and environmental impacts to the benefit of all of Europe collectively. Uh, Different area of transboundary chain challenges have, are involve food and water and energy issues. And one uh, example from many of the Yasa's work in this area concerns the uh, effort to use integrated solutions for water, energy, and land, which combines systems analysis in dealing with ex and, and promotes extensive stakeholder engagement and dialogues to meet water, energy, and land demands in the Indus Basin, which is, a, as you all know, a transboundary basin shared by both Pakistan and India, two countries with have a long history of, of conflict. Um, he also has also tried to help support um, the science diplomacy efforts by organizing a global meeting of science advisors in ministries of foreign affairs, which actually was one of the last face-to-face -face meetings held at EASA. This was in November of 2019, just before the pandemic, pandemic started and the world went into lockdown. 
In the last couple of years, EOS has actually worked to articulate a new research strategy for the decade of 2021 to 2030. And this strategy has several pillars, one of which is to emphasize work on the twin problems of production and consumption. Another pillar is to focus on biodiversity and ecosystem services. And a third pillar is to focus work on the broad themes of equi equity and resilience. And then within those pillars, there'll be a focus on specific areas like um, population and behavior, technology and innovation, economy and society, governance and institutions. Under this broad research strategy framework, uh, EOS is now in the final processes of developing a specific research plan for the next uh, four years. Now, let me just conclude by saying that EOSA has about 350 scientists and support staffs who come from all of the participating countries. So it is very broadly international and it has had a, a long and proud history of contributing to solutions of, for major international problems and providing those potential solutions to decision makers in a way that has helped their implementation at governmental levels. So that's the, and I'm very sorry about not being able to show the presentation. I hope I'm Thank still you, with you. <laughs> yep, you're still with us, we heard you. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can certainly see the breadth of potential contributions and, uh, and uh, IASA really has, has been in a lot of them. Not in, this is even talking basic science in other areas, but the, the range of potential contributions that people can make in the science diplomacy areas is, is, uh, is really well demonstrated by that group. Um, oops. Our last uh, talk today is by Ronit Prower. Uh, uh, she is the director of the uh, United Kingdom's Government Science and Innovation Network uh, for the Eastern US. Uh, she's up in the Boston area. Uh, she works to grow and strengthen bilateral relationship between Great Britain and the U.S. on research and innovation. Uh, before arriving in the U.S., she served uh, for three years as a science attache to the British ambassador in Tel Aviv, where she established the U.K.'s science, first science diplomacy projects in the region. Uh, she actually hails from Melbourne, Australia, where she trains in genetics and worked to identify genes underlying uh, male infertility. Uh, in addition to her uh, genetics qualification. She holds a degree in English literature and French from the University of Melbourne. So a, a well-rounded person. And uh, she was at our talk at our conference in 2019 and great, gave a great talk. Uh, I think uh, uh, we will hopefully get a, a similar one today. I'm sure we will. So Ronit, I will pass it to you when you're ready. Great. I will share my screen and hope that you can see it. Okay, great. So hi. Um, everyone, and thanks for the introduction, uh, Kevin. It's so great to be with you all today. Um, so first and foremost, you know, a huge thank you to uh, Professor Hassan Vafai and to Kevin for um, inviting me today. I mean, the two of them have kind of single-handedly established a hub of science diplomacy at University of Arizona, which is an amazing community such an honor to be part of. Um, and the work of the STEM Diplomacy Initiative has just been astonishing. It's given rise to a hugely impressive set of publications and conferences. So if you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to peruse them and consider attending one of the events that uh, Professor Vafai and his team curate when we're able to gather again. Uh, those have been sort of hugely enriching for me. So I'm looking forward to um, to coming back to U of A at some point. And so thank you to the University of Arizona team for convening us today. So, as Kevin mentioned, uh, I am an active science diplomat rather than a sort of scholar of the discipline like Professor Pafei. Um, in my current role as the director for the British Foreign Office's Science and Innovation Network for the Eastern US, uh, I represent the US government here 
uh, the UK government, sorry, better not get that one wrong. The USAI represent the UK government here in the US. And I oversee some of the elements of our bilateral scientific relationship and my team works to sort of nurture and promote that relationship. Um, on this, my, my always introduction slide, uh, are some of my favorite illustrations of the parameters that, that John helpfully laid out in his opening talk. So um, on the sort of science for diplomacy question, uh, on the top left here, you can see ses an image of inside Sesame, um, which is the synchrotron uh, light for experimental science and applications in the Middle East. I always have to write that one time because I never quite remember the uh, acronym. Um, and so, you know, this is one of the examples of sort of using science cooperation to improve international relations between countries. Obviously, Sesame has members um, where the sort of scientific collaboration goes beyond some of the kind of political collaborations between those countries. So there are members of this, this experiment that where their governments don't necessarily have diplomatic ties at all. Um, and just sort of following up on John's comments, you know, is this one of those one of those um, examples of uh, where we sort of the investment is high and the science returns are quite modest to use John's uh, helpful phraseology um, and what does sort of the personal returns look like or the political returns absent the science returns so that's an interesting question we can come back to um, and then you see the bottom bottom left of this slide is obviously an illustration of science in diplomacy so informing foreign policy objectives with science advice. Um, so obviously that's in the UN where science is an increasingly sort of central part of the conversation, uh, particularly in areas that pour into international law like Antarctica, the high seas, the atmosphere, outer space, etc. Science is often the sort of basis for agreements over their governance. And here I am with my US colleague. I thought I'd show, show that to you all given the US audience. Um, we're desk mates, which is a lot of fun. Um, and then sort of finally on the right, you see uh, an image which for me represents the sort of diplomacy for science uh, side of things. Um, this is a mock-up, it's not a real image, it's a mock-up of, uh, of the SKA, the Square Kilometer Array, so the world's largest radio telescope to explore the universe. And the reason I put this here as diplomacy for science is because um, facilitating international science cooperation uh, is an enormous part of these international projects. And I was sort of fortunate enough to be part of some of the discussions around this, because as you know, the, it's sort of hosted between Australia, South Africa and the UK, as well as countries around the real world. And some of the discussions around kind of how we gather the, um, how we sort of convene the expertise, but also how we convene the funding and how we organize some of the sort of um, political support that that science needs um, becomes kind of the, the central tenet of this sort of work. So this for me is a great example of that. So um, how do I move to my next slide in this screen sharing situation? Oh, there we go. Uh, okay, so I had initially thought that I would present to you some recent work on sort of measurements and metrics for science diplomacy, but um, having just kind of heard John's astute commentary on the role of scientists in government service and sort of Michael's analysis of a long-term science diplomacy case study, I've pulled up an older set of slides. Um, I think it might perhaps be a little bit more useful for me to zero in on a different kind of case study um, viewed through the lens, I suppose, of my own role as an active science diplomat in government, in a government service, which is not the US government service. So I think this might sort of lend some texture to these discussions as well as perhaps an international perspective. Um, and it might also come at uh, John's extremely relevant challenge on the third paradigm of science diplomacy and, and perhaps allow us to have a more robust discussion there. Um, also sort of addressing Joel's question in the chat. So this question of using science in the sort of the enterprise of diplomacy. Um, that said, we can sort of absolutely return to the question of monitoring and evaluation as we progress, but I realize that not everyone is a data science nerd like me. So perhaps this will be, um, uh, will allow us to have a bit more of a um, meaty discussion on that third science diplomacy paradigm. Um, on that note, though, I should give my a brief disclaimer before we before we dive in. So today I'll, I'll speak to you about my sort of personal experiences as a science diplomat, how it's felt for me as an individual to be working at the intersection of sort of science, government and society on some of these science diplomacy initiatives. But my comments will sort of be about my own personal opinions and experiences rather than those of the, of the British government. Um, so I should just make that make that clear at the start. So. Uh, 
what I think I'll do is I'll sort of home in on two different stories, um, stories of kind of seminal moments in my career, which to me illustrated the power and the potential of science diplomacy to really change international relations. And for each of these stories, what I'll do is I'll tell you the context and the sort of need that we encountered, the program we then devised to, uh, as kind of our contribution to solving that problem. And then I will be quite frank and honest about some of the challenges we encountered. And then I'll give you a sense of the sort of interim outcomes of those programs. Um, before we dive in though, I realize you do not have to be a particularly good linguist to realize that I am not in fact British, I am Australian. Um, so I won't kind of go into all of this sort of how I got here and why, uh, you know, sort of how an Australian ends up working for the Brits. But what I think I should do is tell you why uh, an irreverent antipodean such as myself would want to serve Queen and country in the British civil service. Um, so I thought uh, I'll just spend a, a quick moment telling you about um, the British approach to science diplomacy and, and sort of what, what motivates me to sort of be in this particular paradigm for seven years now, actually. Um, so the, I mean, this is, this is, a little bit of a slide on, on UK science diplomacy. And it's the answer to why an Aussie would want to be working for the Brits. Um, and in part, that's of course, the world-class UK science that I have the honor of representing, but to go beyond the scientific community and more specifically to sort of science diplomacy, the UK has what I consider to be an inspirational and like an extensive history of science diplomacy. I think the UK has been a pioneer in both science diplomacy practice and science diplomacy scholarship. So I always start out by saying that in the 1700s, the British Royal Society appointed its first foreign secretary, Philip Zolman. Um, and his role was explicitly to maintain relationships and share expertise with scientists all over the world. That was his mandate. Now, just for context, it took another 60 years before the British government appointed its own Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs. So in effect, we always like to say that the UK was doing science diplomacy before it was doing any other kind of diplomacy. Um, you fast forward 150 years, the UK sent its first accredited government scientific representative abroad and actually sent them to the US, um, the beginning of the special relationship, you might say. Uh, that gentleman's role was in many ways the precursor of mine. So, um, you know, he was a representative of the US government, uh, of the UK government, there you go, I did it again, the UK government in the US. Um, and his job was to maintain that relationship and to strengthen it. Fun fact, he was actually the grandson of Charles Darwin. So there he is up on the left there. Uh, um, he was also Charles, Charles Galton Darwin, and he was appointed to be the director of Great Britain's Central Scientific Office in Washington, DC. Um, but, you know, it's important to say that the UK's commitment to science diplomacy isn't just sort of Downton Abbey style history with Darwin's and others and, you know, beautiful foreign office buildings, which you can see there. Um, it's, it's very current. Uh, so, you know, fast forward to 2010, the Royal Society authored what is perhaps the seminal piece of work on science diplomacy of the decade. Um, and it was authored together with AAAS. It's referenced here in case you want to see the reference later on. It's called New Frontiers in Science Diplomacy. So, um, it, you know, it, it, it sort of lays out the, the three paradigms that John mentioned earlier, they derived from this paper. Um, and it's not just a kind of landmark report here or there or a particular action or activity. It's actually a significant shift in modus operandi. The UK government was pretty early to appreciate the sort of changing nature of diplomacy and to adapt its foreign service accordingly. So, you know, case in point, when countries send ambassadors abroad, they send them with key staff members attached to them. So hence the French term attaché, who are attached to the ambassador. And, uh, you know, these are sort of the technical experts who are assigned to the staff of a diplomatic mission. It might be a political attache or an economic attache or a cultural attache or a military attache. Um, and rather than having science as a subset of other portfolios, as many other countries did, the UK recognized early that it would be good to invest, invest in specialized science attaches. And if you think about it, this makes complete sense. Um, and it's in fact a sort of critical level of specialization. You know, we know that not everyone speaks science and an economic attache might have the language for IP, but not for PIs. And the military attache might be able to discuss global security, but not necessarily food security. So um, 
you know, the sort of person you want to be in the negotiation room on some of these international issues is a, somebody with a scientific background. So in the late 90s, the UK started to include a science attache in the critical team dedicated to the bilateral scientific relationship. And these science attaches make up the network that I manage here in the US. So uh, the UK Science and Innovation Network or SIM for short, and yes, that is definitely the best three letter acronym in government. We are affectionately known as the SINners. Um, it's the first of its kind globally. It now has a hundred offices in 40 countries all over the world. Um, and uh, I think I have included, yes, here is our sort of our objectives. These are publicly available. You can see these on our website. This is what our network works to do. Um, I'm gonna race just in the interest of time. We're supported in doing that with several, um, uh, you know, a suite of funding instruments and programs that allow us to do that work. Um, and so this is why I'm sort of very, very interested in my work with the UK government. Um, and this is why in 2013, when I was working for the Aussies, as it happened, I was approached by the British ambassador to Israel, who said, I want science to be the sort of foundation of the wider bilateral relationship. And you can see now very quickly why I said, yes, I'm in. And I began working with the British Civil Service, which is where I've been ever since. And that brings me, I think, to the story that I want to, to share with you today. So um, from 2013 to 2016, I was the science attaché to the British ambassador to Israel. For those kind of unfamiliar with the region, a few basic facts, some geography here. I am not, uh, there'll be many people on this Zoom call who are far more expert uh, in international politics than me, but I will tell you a little bit. So here is, you can see a map of the region, um, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Israel, Palestine, the occupied Palestinian territories, Egypt, etc. Um, this is just to give you a sense of the size of this tiny, tiny region of the world. So the same scale maps you can see there, Israel in blue pasted on my native Australia, here on Mexico, and here in Lake Michigan, Israel is actually smaller than Lake Michigan, which makes it sort of astonishing that um, the, you know, the country specific UN general assembly resolutions are disproportionately about that particular tiny region of the world. And that sort of tells you about the sort of level of um, intensity and drama that the region sees, which I don't need to, to go into detail on. What I will tell you about uh, is a little bit about uh, the, the sort of work that we did on science diplomacy in the region. So when I began my role as science attache in Israel, I was introduced to a brilliant Palestinian scientist through a friend of my family, whose name is Hassan. And Hassan was once talking to me about his students. And at some point during our conversation, it dawned on me that they were all abroad um, in labs all around the world. And being globally connected is of course not uncommon for scientists, but this was pretty extreme. And so I asked him about it and Hassan explained to me that if you graduated from an MA in a STEM discipline in the occupied Palestinian territories, you basically had three choices. Either you leave academia with an MA or you stay on at the university to teach, or you head off to do your PhD abroad as many, uh, you know, many in the sort of US and in Europe. Um, and he explained to me that this was because Palestinian universities had limited capacity to award doctoral degrees in the exact sciences. That is changing, um, but, and, and here are some sort of interesting pieces about it, particularly recommend to you Alison Abbott's uh, piece on uh, in Nature two years ago. Um, but as many of you kind of will know, a PhD is a sort of half a decade proposition. So a lot of young Palestinian scientists left academia rather than leaving their homes to go to Europe or the US to undertake what is understandably an incredibly long process. Now, barely 10 kilometers away in, as you saw from our tiny, tiny map, um, uh, in Israel's sort of world-class laboratories, I was having a very different conversation with Israeli principal investigators. Um, Israel, has more high-tech startups and a larger venture capital industry uh, per capita than any other country in the world other than the US. Um, Israel leads the world in R&D spending relative to its GDP. I think it's around 4.2%. Um, so in Israel, the booming high-tech industry was growing. For many of these companies, an MA graduate was the perfect employee. The expertise of a PhD was sort of better achieved on the job. Um, the high-tech industry was basically devouring the best MA students. So it turned out that Israeli labs and academics were actually desperate for high quality MA graduates to come and do PhDs with them. So 
you know, whether it's naivety or optimism or stubbornness or, or in fact, science diplomacy, uh, I decided that what I wanted to do was bring Palestinian students, whether it was a need to Israeli labs, whether it was sort of, you know, simple question of supply and demand, right? So what we did was we devised a fully funded five-year fellowship for graduates of Palestinian universities to do their PhDs in Israel. Uh, there was particular UK, it says the UK link, we had sort of specific UK uh, angle there because we would have these people come to the UK to do parts of their professional development. Uh, we named it Growth, Graduate Research Opportunities in Water Tech and Health. There you can see some of the application details translated into Arabic, which was just a great joy to see. Um, and that program was one of the first UK's first science diplomacy initiatives in the region. Now, just so that you kind of, you can't see my gray hairs on Zoom, but just to kind of be clear about the fact that this was not just, you know, something we sort of did overnight. Um, here are some of the challenges that we faced, and I'm not going to go through an exhaustive list because that would be exhausting um, but you can see here are some of the things that that we came up against in doing this so obviously there are things like funding how do you fund the program you need to ensure that you have a full five years worth of funding because you want to ensure that uh, people who start this have that funding guaranteed and insured um, but there there were a whole host of things that we some of which we anticipated and many of which we didn't uh, uh, some of the things that that we came across and you can see a families that was a big issue because students coming to uh, from um, Palestinian universities and some of them actually moving to be closer to their research communities, you then needed to think about what their families were gonna do. Um, and that involved work visas and things of that nature. Um, uh, language, so, uh, you know, some of the wild Palestinian um, researchers that we were working with had excellent English, Hebrew is another story. So sometimes we had, to, we actually ended up providing some additional language uh, um, resources uh visas and travel were a huge issue uh, people who were living in the west bank and how like they you know some of them were going through checkpoints and it was taking three hours a day to get to and from their labs um uh publicity was one of the biggest things that that actually a challenge i did not anticipate because um how do you advertise to Palestine, graduates from Palestinian universities where, you know, it might not be obvious that like, if, you know, obviously these are brave and curious young minds who we want to support who are interested in this, but it's not that easy to pop a, you know, pop an ad in the, you know, local Palestinian paper and say, hey, come and do a PhD in Israel. So how do you get the word out to, to excellent researchers? So all of these were sort of challenges. I'm happy to talk about how we kind of came across, how we, you know, address any of these particular issues. Here's the status. So these are some of the amazing fellows of the growth program. There is the British ambassador in the middle there and yours truly. There are lots of people behind the camera, uh, standing behind the photographer. Um, and it's important for me to say that just because, you know, some of the people who took part in this program did so with uh, taking on a sort of enormous personal risk as well to them and their families and their own safety. So they sort of didn't want to ever sort of be in front of the camera. That was something that was very important to them and obviously something that we sort of took very seriously and really respect um, the need to kind of protect that privacy. Um, the growth program is uh, something that kind of, I think it really um, illustrates the power of science diplomacy to change relationships in the region. Um, I once, took a senior diplomat to visit one of the labs where we had some growth fellows and um, we walked in to find one fellow holding the baby of another one who had just dashed out to prayers. And uh, I think that sort of nothing can really um, replace that, that moment for either me or the visiting diplomat who was expecting a PowerPoint presentation, but instead got this incredibly human moment of uh, kind of connection that I, that I know will sort of endure over over many, many years. And so I think these are up to their third cohort now. Um, and they're incredibly special people and it's just our job to sort of support them. So I'm, I'm running over time. I do have like another couple of examples of um, science diplomacy programs in the region, lots more challenges as you can imagine, uh, but we can, we can talk about those uh, in the Q and A if that's helpful. Um, here are my contact details if anyone is interested in continuing this conversation. Um, but I hope that that sort of gives us a, an interesting sort of springboard into the question of, you know, uh, the ways in which international scientific collaboration can really change the tone of 
um, international diplomatic discussions as well. So I'll leave it there and hand it back to you, Kevin. Great. Great. Thank you, Ronit. Um, John and Mike, if you want to put your, well, I, I guess we should ask questions and then we'll see who comes on. So make sure you're you at least have your face there, and then if you need to speak, we'll we'll either flip on the, um, the the voice. So we have about 20 minutes left or so, and maybe less than that. So let's get right to this. Um, a couple of questions from the audience that came through, um, somewhat with the idea of, of what we can gain from science diplomacy. Um, if you read the first question, I, I'll sort of paraphrase it here. Uh, essentially. Uh, Trust building, international understanding are, are valuable diplomatic goals in themselves. Um, and this is not advocating the use of science as for some ulterior or specific political end. Um, can you comment on how that is that uh, the beliefs of science diplomats, that science diplomats, or, or are they looking specifically for specific ends and outputs of these, of the relationships you're trying to develop? Um, just a quick, quick answer. Uh, I think that the science community in general has been magnificent. Uh, and, and I mean that around the world. That we, it's, it has been easy to sign up absolutely top world-class people. Uh, we've never, it's, it's remarkable how few, uh, how few problems we have. And, and of course, scientists that, you know, being real people, in fact, sometimes very real people, very colorful people, uh, do have personal uh, attitudes and they aren't all the same. Uh, Israeli scientists are, have, are, have a very interesting spectrum of, of, of attitudes on, on, on some tough questions. But no, I, I, I just, my hat's off to the science community for actually doing it right. I, I, the, the problems that I alluded to most almost entirely come from outside the science community itself. This is my kind of rough answer to that. I, I certainly agree with John. I think uh, my experience is it, it, during the years when I was foreign secretary at the academy, traveling around and, and meeting the science communities around the world, uh, it was really impressive how willing and anxious people were to engage, but also um, much of the leadership of the science community outside of the US had received international training in the course of their careers, often in Europe or in the US or abroad. And so they came to it with a very global perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, from my perspective, like Joel, it's an excellent question. And, you know, you say in your question, it's in every country's interest to engage in trust building and international understanding and cooperation. And I think that's true. I think in, in you know, I might even go a step further than that. It's in every country's interest to help other countries engage in trust building and international understanding and cooperation. And I think, you know, for the UK, there, there, there are actual sort of funding schemes that are available to UK diplomats to use in the context of the Middle East in order to sort of support programs like this. Um, and I think you see also in sort of, you know, in terms of like aid structures, so many of those are, um, you know, available to career diplomats to, to support initiatives that will, you know, in the long term, create sort of global stability because they encourage these sorts of this type of cooperation. And I always sort of said to my colleagues who worked on those programs, you know, it's all very well, you know, funding programs for, you know, kids to do summer camp together. But if you fund, you know, scientists are, if you give them a joint problem and some funding to work on it together, that is the kind of glue that will stick people together for a very long time, especially sort of early career scientists. So, um, so yes, you know, I think not only, uh, not only do you make a really good point about how this serves an in, like a national interest, I think, um, you know, that, that countries that sort of have uh, aid structures invest in this really consciously because they do see it as part of their national interest. Great, thank you. Um, I'll follow with Dave Pizza's uh, question, the second question that came through, uh, and now it, it moves to the other side where, where uh, 
a relationship we're trying to develop has some self-interest on the other side. Um, and how do we react to that? And, and he talks specifically American, but, but I think this could be generalized that uh, how should the community react when, when uh, we're acting in good faith and we see a perceived gain uh, is, is the objective from our, our the, uh, the counterparts. I'm, I'm trying to think of an example. <laughs> it's, uh, um, um, yeah, well, you know, we're, I'm not sure this isn't a, this, this is a, a, a tough question, but right now there are a wide range of, of um, aspects, let's say, of the US-China relationship, uh, which, uh, which do raise some questions. Uh, I, I think, as, as well, I, I think that I would stand by what I said uh, even in this rather difficult situation in some aspects of our relationship uh, with Chinese, uh, Chinese scientists, I, I don't know of the problems that exist really coming from scientists. And, and I, can get, I can give you, and this is really maybe over the edge, but uh, about, you know, in, in the first few days of COVID-19, um, we sent a message from some of these people who had no, known, between some of these people who had known each other in these uh, dialogues of high level scientists and that talked about biosecurity and biosafety and so on. And they had relationships and we sent it to, and this is slightly indelicate, but top level people who corresponded to our CDC and who headed their science science academy, we got uh, a, a, uh, a positive general response, which was frankly reversed by the government. Uh, and uh, and the, the, it took some more time than it should have to, to launch the real scramble, uh, you know, to put together the to sequence the genome and so on and so on. So I, I, I guess I would stand by what I said. It, has, it, might, it does happen and things, things are difficult, but it almost never in my knowledge, in my experience came from the science community itself. Yeah, once again, I'd agree with John. The only example that I can think of that fits maybe a little bit into the question was the export of uh, nuclear weapons technology through Pakistan and then elsewhere, which was in part the result of a, the actions of a particular scientist. Too. But other than that, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't think most scientists, uh, I, I think the ethos of science makes it unlikely in most cases that you get caught up in these nationalistic mindsets as, as seriously as maybe other players in the international landscape do. Okay. I'm gonna pass on this one, Kevin, because it's a question um, about American diplomacy, so it's not for me to answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I can say the UK has sort of similar challenges and these are kind of universal questions, I think. Right, okay. Um, this question came in before the the comp or the our today, so I want to make sure I get to this uh, before we reach one thirty. If we we can stay on, apparently, if we need to, if you if you would like, but um, we do have some students out there and and, uh, and who are interested in this field. So uh, the the question is: Are there certain steps that a student or young scientist could take to prepare for a career in science diplomacy? Maybe you could start with that, Ron, since, since you are the most recent in, in that field. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, my career is entirely accidental, but, <laughs> but um, I think sort of, I would say three things I usually tell people. The first is um, 
there are lots of internships around in different organizations and I'm sure that uh, the academies will have some thoughts on this as well. Um, I know that for us, we have an internship. Uh, I will use this opportunity to tell you to think about it and apply for it. We're, as I told you, we have the best acronym in government. We're the SIN network. So we call our internships a SIN internship because we're very clever that way. Um, and so I would say, you know, apply for things like this, do policy internships. It's very, really like, there are so many uh, to choose from and you can do them around your studies. I think most organizations are very understanding of the fact that sort of PhD students have cells to tend to and they'll help you kind of do this in your own time as well. Um, the second thing I would say is get involved in kind of community initiatives. I mean, you are a scientist already. Your expertise is hugely valued. Sit on boards, join, you know, organizations where you can contribute that expertise. And there will be lots of those, um, whether it's kind of like your, you know, city council has, uh, you know, a group that where scientific expertise might be necessary or relevant because they're thinking about, you know, a climate initiative or what, what have you. Um, don't forget that you're not just, you know, a student, quote unquote, you are an expert, particularly, this particularly applies to sort of PhD researchers and postdoctoral researchers. I call them researchers rather than students. Um, and then the third thing I would say is just kind of, you know, uh, sometimes these uh, organizations can be quite um, sort of cagey in the way that jobs are advertised, particularly in government. And I think maybe Michael and John can elaborate on that a bit as well, but take some time to talk to people in government about how jobs are actually advertised, because it can be quite sort of complicated it's not a sort of LinkedIn easy thing it can be a little bit more mired in bureaucracy so just kind of be aware of that so those are my top three comments maybe I'd, I'd like to take the opportunity to advertise the young scientist summer program of EASA which is uh, turns out to be a wonderful program that has influenced a large number of people over the years it only takes about 50 young people mostly at the PhD or early postdoctoral levels, but it provides a, a very stimulating international experience. Beyond that, I don't know of any set curricula in uh, universities, for example, focused on science diplomacy. And, and part of that is that, that um, scientists don't have very many direct inputs <laughs> into the decision-making community. I, I listened to an interesting lecture by Cedar, Sir Peter Gluckman, uh, week or two ago where I thought he made that point fairly forcefully that, uh, for example, in UN organizations and so forth, the connections that, by which science advice ends up getting into those kinds of organizations is pretty idiosyncratic at present. And so um, I think there's a lot more to be done to develop a real discipline of science diplomacy. Yeah. I. I... I think Grunet had a very, really good list for starters. I, I, I just agree with all of that. The, the other thing I would just add to that good list of ideas is um, pretty much everybody has some exposure to high level scientists in their, in their department or their, their teachers or whatever. And I guess I would I would add to that again, Ron. It's good list of things to do. Uh, tell your tell your professors what you're interested in, and and that you want to that you want to do science, but you also are interested in its implications and 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 uh, and its br and broader contribution to important things. Sometimes that can trigger some really interesting mentoring and. Uh, I mean, it, it did in my case, but uh, uh, I, I, I would add that to the list. Uh, there's actually another question if someone wants to, to respond to, to seeing how we might even get people earlier than PhDs uh, to be interested in science and, and work with the community. I think that there's a question that someone might wanna to reply to in the, in the notes there. Because it is, how do we, uh, we're, we're catching people when they're graduate students, but is there a way to even develop them earlier on uh, to get people interested and motivated about connecting science with policy? Can I give you a quick, a quick example? Uh, sure, uh, this, is, this is really exciting. I'm thinking, I think you start at the beginning. Uh, there's a real effort underway by a lot of enthusiastic people around the world, but in the US it's uh, the main, uh, doing this at the Smithsonian, uh, and they are developing science curriculum for kindergarten through 12 
but they're they're they are deliberately integrating into that curriculum information that is that is directly useful in in addressing some some actual problems and you know like learn about the first the first thing they did was a a whole a whole uh, let's say set of learning experiences related around mosquitoes and which resulted in information about how do you control mosquitoes in your in your household and, and immediate community and that's grown into a whole series and i i just think there's lots that we can do and and that's just opens up a, a huge uh set of possibilities starting at the very beginning great thank you yeah ron do you do what we like to say something there i, I see your no just wow Okay. <laughs> um, okay. These, these are from elsewhere, um, and, and these are I'll, I'll package them together. I realize they're somewhat different, but I'll, I'll you may want to try to address them in combination with each other. Um, you mentioned, I think John mentioned, pandemic planning was not we could have done better there. Um, what issues do you see science diplomats need to keep an eye out for the next five to ten years? Uh, are there questions we aren't paying much attention to right now, but we should be, uh, that's coming down the line? I mean, it's, you know, if we, we all sort of want to go back and say we should have, we should have been thinking about pandemics, you know, as, as John mentioned, I think, you know, for me, the biggest issue is climate, honestly. The, uh, it's not an issue that we're not thinking about, it's an issue we are thinking about, but I would say certainly for the UK government uh, and for my team, climate is at the, the, the top of the agenda. Um, we're hosting the uh, UN Conference of the Parties at COP26 in Glasgow at the end of this year. Um, so, you know, obviously there's a kind of event on the horizon to help us think about climate, but you know, obviously it is a much broader discussion and um, something we're going to have to kind of really everyone, you know, this is a question where everyone needs to muck in. It's not a question that where, you know, we all arrive at COP26 and sign off new plans and everything is hunky-dory, as they say in Australia. Um, we really sort of uh, need to focus all of our scientific efforts and all of our political prowess on this. So yeah, could I, my could I, I think that's right. I agree climate change is huge. And, and, and what, I mean, one thing I think that we really need to do as a science community is is start getting getting quite serious and quite specific about the costs of mitigation. Uh, I mean, the cost of adaptation, and making it really clear how that cost of adaptation escalates dramatically to the degree that we fail to to to, to mitigate. And and I, I just think that has to that has to come home in in sort of pretty clear numbers is what it's going to cost if if the sea if the sea rises two meters uh and and so on and and those are those are staggering numbers and and we but we have to it's already rising it's already something we have to do but i think i think there's a double reason to do it and do it well and that is to to to, to make it clear to society how much is still at, at stake and and for example and we have to be really clear when we talk about the story because too many people, even right up to um, high level uh, politicians sort of think that CO2 in the air is a problem and 40% of it goes into the ocean and we only have to worry about the other part. Well, no, that 40% that that goes into the ocean is also causing really serious long-term damage. So we got to tell the story clearly and, and, and fully. Yeah, I agree. I, I tried to think about that, that question as well. And uh, some of the things that, that occurred to me were geoengineering, which is going to be out there as a potential option, just because the, as the pressures get greater and costs get greater, and we really need to understand what the unintended effects might be. Um, Food, uh, water nexus is going to be crucial. It's certainly being revealed to be pretty important right now during the pandemic. And uh, human genome modification, which is something that we're going to see more pressure for, I suspect. Um, and then the, the thing that's really current right now that I think will also play out in interesting ways in the future is tech-based surveillance of populations, which is you know pretty uh, Orwellian. <laughs> 
I will grab the last question or the question I jumped over on in the in the Q&A here. Um, it came up during your talk, Ron, so you might want to uh, see about it. Um, the can attaches inadvertently perpetuate global inequalities. Uh, what can be done to ensure that all countries can participate on a level playing field as possible uh, to ensure that we all have all hands on deck when it comes to science and science diplomacy? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think uh, it's sort of, it's inbuilt inequality in the sense that some countries just have more money that they will invest in their global diplomatic apparatus and the same goes for science diplomacy. So, you know, you might have some countries with like a beautiful embassy in whatever country and they host one event a week and they have, you know, great cocktails and all of the, you know, important people attend. Um, and they have a team of 15 science diplomats. But you're always gonna have that inequality in the sense that governments will always have different levels of investment that they can put into their foreign presence, everything from the physical embassy to the staffing. Um, but it is, and, and it is something I think that probably perpetuates inequality, although Michael and John will be able to say more about that from their experiences abroad. Um, I think in terms of, of science diplomacy, one of the interesting parts about this is that it's actually not just governments. It's, uh, you know, organizations like learned academies and like international scientific bodies that work together within these frameworks as well. So I think that is a great sort of a leveler because you don't, you know, you don't, you're not talking about a government investing funding in science diplomacy staffing around the world. Fellows of the academy are elected internationally. The same goes for, you know, kind of the academies in the, both the US and the UK. So I think that does sort of level the playing field and it is a different forum for science diplomacy um, capacity that countries have that is less dependent on government investment. Well, just, just very quickly, there's also a domestic version of, uh, aspect of, of inclusiveness. And, and if, our, if our diplomats and our scientists are all, all old white guys, that 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 doesn't that doesn't really work, and and that's that's something that is really getting a huge amount of, of effort now. I think in many in many countries, uh, certainly in the United States, and that's that's a topic for a whole different uh, 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 seminar. I think. You know, one of the things that struck me, and, and I'm speaking as kind of a distant observer in a way, is that the diplomatic apparatus is very much uh, bilateral. It's country to country because countries are where governments exist and everything. But there's a big empty space on, at the regional level. Most of the problems we face are at least regional, if not global. And the way in which we address those is limited by this rigid bilateral framework. Okay. Um, I think that's where we'll end. We're already pushing uh, a quarter or 20 of, so uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to go too late here. Um, and I do want to, whoops, let's see here. I, I do want to, to uh, remark on uh, universities are digging in now. And I think uh, Dr. Meshkati's comment that he's been teaching a class for a, a while at, at USC. Uh, other schools are trying to start to do the same things and recognize that uh, if we can help uh, both uh, get people better prepared for science diplomacy and policy positions, as well as helping improve the diversity, I think is really important for us. Um, so um, I will leave it there uh, and go through my thank yous now. If uh, I'd like to thank uh, first the panelists, they were really great. We really enjoyed the talks and, and thank you for your contributions. I, I, uh, <clears throat> you were it was wonderful helping us at the University of Arizona and, and getting word out to folks. So thank you for, for all your stimulating talks. Um, I'll give you a clap on that here somewhere. <laughs> oh my, I can only raise hands, so that's a post to <laughs> clap. <laughs> um, thanks to Brian uh, Topping, David Hostetler, Jennifer Cruz at the university for helping us pull things together here and making this look professional. Um, uh, and again, to Dr. Bafai for, for pulling this uh, first, first seminar in our series together. Um, again, keep an eye out for some notices on food security. If you, have, uh, if you have interest or if you get a notice, please pass it along. We have, we're continuing to develop our mailing list for publicity on these events. So 
um, either pass it along or pass us back names if, if you think some other people should be getting our announcements. Um, again, thank you. Uh, that's our end. I will end our, in our first seminar there and I appreciate you all coming out and, and joining us here. Um, uh, okay. Thanks, John. Thanks, Thanks Mike. Everybody. Thanks, Ronnie.